Halloween. Mystery lurks around every corner. Bundle up with Disney Plus and Hulu. What are you scared of? The dark. It's spine tingling fun on Disney Plus with Haunted Mansion and Goosebumps. I'm going to need you to spread the word. Then feel the bone chilling terror on Hulu with the Boogeyman and American Horror Story Delicate. Something's happening to me. The Disney Bundle with Hulu and Disney Plus. All of these and more streaming this month. Plans starting at $9.99 a month. 18 plus only. Access content from each service separately. Offer valid for eligible subscribers only. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic, a two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic formulated with 24 clinically and scientifically studied strains to support healthy regularity and your gut, immune, and skin health. Optimize your gut health. Visit seed.com slash Spotify with code Spotify for 30% off your first month of Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Hello and welcome to The Paddock and the Pavilion with me, your host, Stephen Wallace. On today's show, we are back with Jenny Thompson for All Over the World, Part 2. In Part 2, Jenny explained how women's cricket is now thriving throughout the world, despite the barriers they have faced and still do. I also posed Jenny the question, where will the women's game be in 10 years' time? I found out how the world's leading cricket traveller has been dealing with the mental and physical challenges of playing cricket all over the world, including the occasional tour disaster, her unusual nickname, all in a packed 30-minute pod. We began part two with some Ashes chat. Jenny, while you were on your Her World cricket tour, the women's Ashes were also on. How did you follow the the series all around the world um just however i could be it people just telling me what was going on or i would um sit and watch some i was in england for quite a bit of it um and it, it's always the way that when you're somehow in cricket that's almost when you see the least cricket it's it was always the way somehow when i was a, like working at cricket info that that could happen yeah, but, you know, even whether I could watch it some or not, it, the excitement was palpable, but also, of course, absolutely loving the general awareness of the general public about the players, the play. And, you know, I mean, this has been the case for a while now, but I do, I do love how in England in particular, you know, women's cricket these days is just, referred to you know just as is and you know the players are described as you would describe the men there's no oh they can play you know these days that's just accepted and that's a nice world to live in so um great series the men's was a great series so yeah it was it was nice to be around England for the ashes because uh you know I mean it's always a good time but particularly when you have excellent cricket and competitive and gripping but um some of the men's ashes i was actually in latvia with my former editor at cricket info Stephen lynch and it was funny because we were just you know sitting there watching cricket in latvia and uh yeah i say I, I don't know that that's what i love about the tour is cricket of any description in unexpected places so yeah that's what we did what was the reaction from some of your friends in Australia about the the women's series? Um, do you know, I didn't. I have. I've barely spoken with some of my my friends in Australia. Um, just as it's all been so so whirlwind. Um, yeah, but obviously they were quite happy. On a on wider issues, what conclusions have you made? so far about women's cricket all around the world it, it it seems to be thriving and you're finding the passion and the excitement from so many different countries yeah absolutely and of course women's cricket's in various stages of development across different countries and it will progress at different places in all of these countries on various factors 
you know, um, fund. It's not just say funding and facilities. It's how that funding is used and you know access to the facilities for the women. And as with you know, we, we're just dealing with life here essentially. So you know, uh, it's very dependent in many cases, as as all organisations are in having the key people in the key roles with the key passion and the key skill sets. So, you know, you, you can just sort of get a, a sense that some countries will develop faster than others because of the people who are driving um, women's cricket. Now, I think it's so good. It's, I mean, it's critical, really, in many, many countries Um how the ICC have mandated um, for women and junior development to be part of uh, countries' plans in order to get the funding because, you know, even if you call that a sort of artificial um, requirement, it doesn't matter to me. I, I don't care if it gets women and girls and boys into the game you know wouldn't we just rather have as many people playing as possible and um you know i was talking the other day with the icc like the next frontier from that is going to be disability cricket of course because you know there's for so long been the oh it's too hard with women it's too hard i can't do it but then suddenly there's a financial incentive and suddenly you can do it and then you know we'll then see that with disability cricket where people it's too hard at the moment but yeah it's uh it's still it's still I'm still wrapping my head around that you can rock up in pretty much any country and I'm confident you can find not just cricket but women playing cricket and you know yes in some countries there's only a few right now but we're just at the beginning and you know, the fact that there are a few means that there can always be more. So, yeah, it's, uh, I, I love it. And, and I love why women play or why anyone plays really. But I think particularly women, because there are always those extra bar- barriers and challenges to playing. So, um, you know, why and how and so many inspirational people and being so generous, sharing their stories that I feel really privileged to be able to then share with a wider audience. It's funny, you must be really my notes here. I'd put down people and barriers. But just going back before that, uh, you've, you've gone to so many different places. Have they really, has it surprised you, the different countries where there is cricket being played? Absolutely. And particularly because I've been out of cricket for such a long time, I feel in some ways that I've been like in a film cryogenically frozen and then in, uh, brought out into this bizarre, bizarre. That was Mel Gibson. Brilliant. Mel Gibson, that was, wasn't it? Yeah. How was it? I was thinking more of like Austin Powers. But then, you know, you go out into this uh, brilliant world where you can pretty much rock up into any country and find women playing cricket now in some way shape or form and there's different ways like I'm a big fan of softball cricket but because of how accessible it makes cricket for particularly women but you know um yeah I'm I'm still constantly surprised but in some ways I'm not surprised about anything at the same time so I just it's so exciting. Like I was told there was no women's cricket in the Philippines and there is, I, you know, um, just being in Scandinavia, hearing cricket in all the different languages still makes me very, very happy. I love it. I just think this random arcane, but being made modern sport reaching into all these different countries but the way that it's embraced by the people who just give it a go and it's so it's such a weird sport isn't it it's not just straightforward but people love it so where do you think women's cricket can be in say 10 years time where do you hope it will be yeah it's a huge question um well obviously i hope Everybody builds on everything that I'm seeing. And I think that 
really key thing to do next is not just develop women's cricket, but really introduce cricket to girls. Wherever I'm going, there are programs in schools which are, you know, the start of it. But really, you need to definitely engage the girls because they're the future. And, um, you know, it's absolutely possible. Why not? These challenges remain in all the countries. Some of the countries' first challenge is just awareness of the sport, you know. Um, talking with Marie, France's captain the other day, I've heard her story many times, but every time I think about it, it blows my mind that three years ago, she did not know cricket because she thought it was croquet when she was told about it, as does every other French person, it seems. And then now, within two years, she was France's captain of a sport she'd never heard of, you know. And she said to me that, as other countries are saying, you know, awareness of what cricket actually is, is the first thing. And hopefully we'll get the news on, I believe it's October the 15th of the whether cricket's going to be in the Olympics or not. And if it is, that's going to have a massive impact on countries where cricket is not a traditional sport. A, because it will inspire governments to fund that sport as it's an Olympic sport. But something that Marie also mentioned, which I suppose is obvious when you think about it, is the fact that it will be visible in in X country now. And you can say, oh, okay, so that's cricket, is it? That's in the Olympics. I didn't know it. And then, you know, you can bring that locally and uh, leverage that. So let's hope for that result for cricket um, with the Olympics. But, yeah, I mean, I'll just, you know, for, for decades, centuries, really, women have been shut out of sport. And it's not, I'm getting passionate now, it's not just in cricket, is it? We've seen it in football. Look at the FA, look at England. Look at women being shut out of football for 50, 50 years, 50. That's just crazy in the 20th century. And now look what they're doing. And I think also we're going to see that you can't, well, we've seen it already, you can't argue with the stats of it. Coco Goff, she was just just like, she had higher viewership than the men's equivalent match. You know, it's like well, when the stats start coming in, because for so long our women's sport isn't commercial, well, it's becoming commercial. And then that's going to be the incentive around the world as well to grow that aspect of the game. So, and I, I just think power of numbers as well, you know, I mean, women are 51% of the population and women are starting, well, we've always been standing up, but we're starting to stand up with some power behind us and some money. So, you know, it it's so exciting, honestly. And lots of countries are saying to me, you know, we're just at the beginning and we feel excited. So um, I'm very excited to see where we can go. And like I say, you can't expect uniform growth because that's unrealistic. But, you know, 10 years now from 10 years ago, it's just it's going to be chalk and cheese in, in, in a very exciting way. Well, I hope you're going to be part of it. You'll have to go out there again. And do another her world cricket tour in a few years' time, and you can keep wicket then. Uh, but now <laughs> well, I want to ask you a few questions about about you personally. Uh, yeah. How have you managed all these different hotel rooms, flight bookings? That must be something that tests you a little bit. I haven't even spoke about spoken about this publicly yet, but I just want to say about doing another her world tour. I was thinking I could take my book on a her world book tour, but anyway. This, I have been a hundred percent of a disaster, right? And <laughs> in my uh, growing up, it, through cricket, I uh, I'm known as Ninny because I do stupid stuff like pick going out to the middle in county matches without my bat. It's a Ninny bat. And um, well, Bob Willis I'm, did then, that once, but uh, oh well, there you go. I mean, yeah. good company. Um, I didn't know he did that. There you go. Yeah, I feel a lot that, better. Yeah. Like when I when I face planted in the France nets, a few people, including um, Italy's Emilia Bartram, 
call me Mark Wood, which made me feel a lot better. So anyway, yeah, Nini, Nini sets off on a world tour. And um, literally everyone who knows me, especially my parents, are just like, not sure how you're going to get around the world. I just don't know. And um, honestly, it's been that chaotic, but weirdly, I thrive on chaos. That since um, I only decided to do it in February, as I mentioned last time. So I only had 10 weeks to plan it, really. And a lot of it's been planned on the fly. But there are just naturally there are some tour disasters so I've turned up um, a week early for a hotel booking and wasn't sure why they couldn't let me into the um, hotel I have booked the same flight on different days I'm going to the Americas next and I've booked flight to the same destination from two totally separate countries because I just I was just trying to book so much all at once that um I've got on the train the wrong way um and it was the last train of the day but luckily there was a bus back the other way that was in Slovenia and I was thinking oh no I'm going to be stranded on a mountain in the middle of the night but um the best slash worst one so far was the other day and I turned up at Dubrovnik airport and I um (laughs) I went to the kiosk and it said no, no, progress to the um, to the human because um, computers saying no, and I thought, oh no, what have I done? And I got to the man, and he just his face, and I was like, oh no, what did I do? Did I book it yesterday? Is my flight tomorrow? Hope it's the tomorrow option because I can still, you know, that's easier. And he said to me, he said. You're on the fly. I said, oh, well, that's all right. Then he said, yeah, but you're on twice. I said, well, okay. He said, but it's two totally separate bookings made on different days. You've done that. You know, it wasn't just like I have hit by flight twice, you know, or something like that. He's like, you've made two totally separate bookings. And I said, oh, I keep doing that. <laughs> and then he really couldn't understand what was going on. And he said, right, should I cancel this flight for your other passenger or is your ghost going to come as well? And I said, do I like that? I'm going to use that in my book. What's your name, please? And he said, it's Bozo, B-O-Z-O. He goes, but not like a bozo. And I said, no, I'm the bozo. And we laughed. But I got on the plane, so that was fine. Disaster. But, you know... It's all material, but it's a lot of expensive material, but nevertheless, it's material. <laughs> That's how I sort of justify everything that goes wrong or is silly or is bonkers. And there's a lot of it. It's a good job you're traveling on your own. But uh, what 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 is it like, though, being on your own for because, you know, in your hotel room, it's almost like uh, it's not it's not like COVID, but you are spending an awful lot of time on your own. Does that bother you at all? Have you had some? Have you had a bad day? Oh, I've had bad days, but not related to being on my own. Um, I love being on my own. During COVID, I was on my own. I live on my own, and I was on my own for great stretches. Okay. Um, no, you may struggle to believe this, Stephen, but I do have times in my life when I need to not talk. Maybe because I'm all talked out, but um, no, I actually love being on my own. During COVID was a great time for me um, because I need time to process, downtime, and also lots of writing time. So I'm always happy when I'm on my own. I've had some bad days, but they haven't related to being on my own. And in many ways, actually, traveling solo is very... um, I was going to say empowering, which it is, but that wasn't what I was thinking. Traveling solo is um, helpful for me because I don't feel guilty for, you know, um, say making other people follow my agenda. I can just do what I need to do, what's important to me right then and there. And I've had some friends join me on the journey. And, you know, before that they've come, I've said, 
just to let you know, I'm going to need time to do this, this, this. And, um, you know, that, that, that's worked out. But, you know, obviously I'm respectful of other people's time, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm doing this, uh, this is actually an sort of undertaking. So it's quite helpful to be able to do it on my own timelines, really. And you need Saturday nights to do um, scoring tutorials, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you you mentioned about um, writing. Um, what's mm. the future hold? Are you is it book, documentary? I mean, you've been you've been in, as I understand. I read you in the cricketer. You've been in the cricket paper. You were on women's mm. cricket chat. You've been, of course, on Stumped. I think twice with yeah. Alison Mitchell. And um, Jim Maxwell, I've forgotten his name there. Uh, what's Jim yeah. like? What's Jim like? Oh, uh, Jim is very laconic, laid back, Aussie actually. He's very chilled out and um, well, he's very dry, dry sense of humor as well. But yeah, I was on uh, Al Jazeera the other day, which is interesting. And I've been on lots of boards, podcasts, and there social media and i'm due to catch up with cricket island soon so you know it's uh it's really nice to be able to share my perspectives of uh, the cricket in the individual countries as well but uh, definitely a book though oh in terms of that absolutely i mean um there were several goals with my tour which uh are you know a, to see countries and meet inspiring people doing inspiring things and inspiring me. And I'm having that in spades. The generosity of people, I'm constantly inspired and energised even when I'm so tired. It doesn't matter because the excitement and interest of what everybody else is doing just lifts me above any fatigue. Um, but it's always been, my goal has always been to write a book about the experience. Um, a, because there are so many funny stories. B, there are so many inspirational stories. Um, I'm going to stop using letters. Um, there are also, you know, I think the messages, messages are very, very important. Um, I also just think the travelogue aspect of um what I'm doing is uh, funny and relatable and interesting. But also the fact that it occurred to me just before I kicked off this tour and I was invited to go to, an, um, in Australia, I was invited to go to my neighbour's library and look at his cricket collection and literally stood out to me the fact that this guy has, of course, he's Australian, shelves shelves and shelves of books on Bradman and I thought hold on hold on there are more books on Bradman than have ever been written about the entirety the entirety of women's cricket and it's time that that began to change and this will be in some way a contribution but also um cricket travel books have been as far as I can see exclusively written by men and it's not right to use the word confined confined to a continent because that's to diminish um which i don't want to do what everybody else has done but um nobody man or woman has written a book about traveling to see cricket around the world so that's different in itself but also um you know i think it's important as a woman as a woman traveller, because I have necessarily different experiences. Um, so, you know, I think, I, th I think it's, uh, I, ju I just think it's really, really important to do. And as much as I'm getting to enjoy putting social media up, I mean, that's not my forte. Uh, and in many ways, it's acting as a great um, document source for when I come to do the book. A book gives you so much more space to share your own um, perspectives and 
broader perspectives of the tour as you're going along and link that all up and bring literally the readers along with you on the journey so you know the book is traditionally my form and my interest and I'm very old school I did chat actually with Georgie Heath um about doing the documentary um she said oh, I should have kind of come with you from the start but of course it was so so whirlwind um and you know had I a there, there were many ways as you can imagine of approaching this tour but I thought, no, I have to, you know, Frank Sinatra would be proud of me. I have to do it my way. So my way was to get on with it immediately. Otherwise, I'd overthink and procrastinate. And my way was to not do it super commercially. My way was to do it organically in the way that interests me. And sure, you know, documentary would have been great. But for me, my documenting of it will be viable. And now it's Mexico. Uh, this podcast yes. is going to go out at the very beginning of October, so you'll already been to so many different countries by then. But where where are you heading off to Mexico? And I know you mentioned Roberta in Brazil, who's very well known to this podcast. Yay, love Roberta. Um, I can't even tell you the order of countries that I'm going or the dates. And is I it got South America, is it? South America. Central South America plus the states and Canada and then on the way back to Manchester for a few days um to see mum and dad um I'm going via Iceland then I'll be off back to Adelaide via Qatar then to Manila for a sixes so it's a little bit frenetic but I'm not even sure where I'm going after Mexico and in Spain they were laughing at me but it's like I'm literally still in Spain scoring and talking with people and trying to put things up and also we were billeted, billeted, that makes it sound like we were on draft or something. We were um, luxuriously accommodated in the villa with a private pool is the better way of putting it. Um, with, you know, I had three housemates there. So, you know, there was that social aspect where was, normally I'm in a hotel room with more time. So I'm going, I mean, I know this is going at a different time, but at the time of recording, I got back last night. I'm going to Mexico in two days and I don't know where I'm going after that because I haven't had time to check my itinerary. It's so ridiculous. But I do know that, you know, um, Belize and Costa Rica are arranging activities for me. And when I'm in Guatemala, there's a mission and they deliver cricket. So they're putting a match on for me. There's lots going on. Um, and um, it will be very exciting when I get there, even more so because I'm not really sure what's going on at the moment, which sounds chaotic. But I know by now from all my experience that everything just falls into place and more than falls into place. Like that's something I've learned on this tour, which is I have a big imagination, but I've given up trying to say, oh, I'd love this, 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 and then con- trying to control or think how that would happen I just put it out there and then that gets delivered plus even more and more and more and more and stuff that I can't even imagine that's beyond my imagination so I'm just I just roll with it and it all falls into place and more so it's just brilliant so if you think I'm sounding casual and chaotic there is there is a there is a big element of that but I'm not worried and neither should anyone else be Well, it's worked so far. As long as your parents pick you up from Manchester Airport and drop you off at the next airport, uh, I'm sure you'll have a fabulous time. At the end of this podcast, when it goes out, I'll have to have contacted you then by email and I can update um, listeners where, where you've been since this interview. Thanks so much for joining me on part two, Jenny. And uh, the very best of luck on the rest of your Her World Cricket Tour. Thank you so much, Stephen. Really appreciate it. Since I last spoke to Jenny, she has been to Mexico, Belize, Costa Rica, Colombia, Peru, and as I record, Chile. She is due to arrive in Brazil on the 18th of October. I hope you have enjoyed All Over the World with Jenny Thompson. I hope to catch up with Jenny again in 2024 
with All Over the World, Part 3. Sports Social Podcast Network. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.